you'll be happy to hear this isn't a speech, it's just a talk, which I like. Uh, the idea for the book, um, In the Houses of Their Dead, came from an earlier book I did on John Wilkes Booth. I realized that his family was into spiritualism, and so were the Lincolns. In fact, the Lincoln family's interest has been known for a long time. So I realized they not only shared an interest in spiritualism, but they actually shared certain spiritualists or certain mediums that they went to, which I thought was kind of new, so I just wanted to, to delve into that. When we say spiritualism in the 19th century, we're talking about something that happened or that really started in this house. It's a movement um, that began in Hydesville, New York, about 20 years before the Civil War. Again, in this simple rural house. It's no longer standing, but the foundation is present, and if you went to this place, you could see that. There was a family living there, Ritter's, I believe, named Fox, and two teenage girls, Maggie and Kate. And in March of 1848, they had gone to bed early one night, and strange noises began to come from their room. They kept the family awake. And they said that uh, a murdered man had been buried in the basement of their house. And he was sending messages by tapping and rapping. And they convinced their mother that uh, this was real. And there were some um, religious people who lived nearby. They were also kind of interested in this. So um, they began to meet with the girls. And it just um, seemed that the dead, um, this murdered man and others, were actually according to the girls, ever present with us, and they were ready to communicate with us. The next thing you know, the girls were being taken around to some of the big cities in western New York, you know, to give presentations of their rapping powers, and this movement spread really very, very quickly. As a matter of fact, uh, two years later, this is the, the girls, Maggie and Kate Fox, and uh, Again, before we leave them, I'll just say this is their home. Uh, but notice that the humble log cabin has now become rather an incredible looking thing. I should really blow this slide up to make it easier to see what this is, but these are angels and spirits descending from the sky into the Fox uh, family home as part of a seance that they were, they were having. Now, as I said, this movement spread very quickly. Um, the idea that the dead again were right there for, for those gifted enough to bridge the divide between the living and the dead. This is an early image, perhaps the earliest image of Springfield, Illinois, where by 1850, which would be two years after the Fox sisters got going, the Lincolns, Abraham and Mary Lincoln, purportedly got interested in spiritualism uh, because their little boy, this is Abraham Lincoln, in the earliest known image of him. He doesn't show his rough frontier origins too well in this. He looks like a prosperous merchant. And I'm sure he was dressed up uh, very appropriately by his wife Mary, who was uh, very fashion conscious and uh, very, as they said in the 19th century, a tasty dresser uh, and very attentive to fashion and, and looked good at what she put on. Um, this was, again, a photo taken about 1846 or 47 when the Lincolns had gone to, um, were on their, on their way to Congress for the first time. Abraham Lincoln was in Congress for one term before he became, before he became, um, left politics for a while and then later was elected to the presidency. In 1850, they lost a child. This is Eddie Lincoln. He died at the age of three. Not much is known about how he died. They think it was a case of tuberculosis, but this is before death certificates were issued, so you're just you know, relying on some memories and a letter, stray family letter or two. It is alleged that the Lincoln family got interested in spiritualism at this time, uh, but that's not very well documented, not like their later interest, which is abundantly documented, uh, I might say. It is fair to say that both Mary and Abraham Lincoln were uh, superstitious. Abraham Lincoln was worried about the number 13. He was certain this was um, an unlucky number. 
uh, and he told a friend, I've always been superstitious, and um, this was just um, a, a number he, he thought, I remember one time when he was in Congress, he was going to join some uh, fellow Congress people for dinner, and he realized if he sat down, he would be the 13th person at the table. And he said, uh, you guys go ahead, I, I'm okay, thanks, I, I'll, uh, I'll catch you later. And they started laughing at him, and one of them said, you know, I'd rather die than be that superstitious. I just, I just couldn't get through the day right if I was like that. Uh, but that was one of his superstitions. Mary, let's see, Lincoln, Mary Todd was her birth name, raised in Kentucky, uh, and she had a so-called quote-unquote mammy whose name was Sally. Uh, Mammy told her that each Friday, told Mary when she was a child, each Friday uh, the jaybirds flew to hell and told the devil all the things you had done that week that were wrong. And of course the devil loved hearing this, you know, his green tail flick, you know, his um, tail, he sharpened his horns on, on the ground. He was delighted to know the terrible things you've done. And she was always afraid of Fridays. Um, that, in fact, was considered by a lot of people to be an unlucky day. Not only was it the day of the crucifixion, uh, you know, in, in Christianity, but it was the day that Eddie Lincoln died. It was the day that Abraham Lincoln's father Thomas died. It was the day Fort Sumter was attacked that started the Civil War. It was the day Abraham Lincoln was shot on. I mean, once you start making a list, it, it is substantial. But people in general were uh, cautious about Friday. Um, People wouldn't begin a long trip on Friday. They wouldn't sign an important contract on Friday. They wouldn't uh, plant an important crop on Friday. They just avoided. They just avoided that day. This, uh, I like to say, is uh, reminds me of one of my classes. Um, have you ever noticed if you ask students a question, you have to ask it twice? The first time you ask it, they become aware that someone else is in the room with them. Then the second time you ask it, they may or they may not answer. But um, this um, brings up a very good question. And that question is, a moment ago I was speaking of spiritualism. Then I started speaking of superstition. Uh, are those the same things or what is the relationship between one and the other? Um, spiritualists in this time, the Foxes and others who came after them, would very indignantly deny they had anything to do with superstition. That spiritualism was something else. It was a modern scientific philosophy. It produced visible, tangible um, results. For example, these knocking noises or apparitions or voices that could be summoned. You couldn't say those were imaginary. You couldn't say those were superstitions. You know, those were physical things. And as a movement, spiritualism was very progressive. You know, it let women have, like the foxes, have very high seats at the table. Uh, they were, and at a time when most churches, you know, all the ministers were men and everything was run by men. Women had a great deal to say in spiritualism. Uh, they didn't believe in a paid clergy. They didn't believe in hell. Uh, they were very progressive in their social agenda. They were anti-slavery. They were for women's rights. So they were viewed as kind of progressive, kind of modern uh, in, in this particular time. Uh, again, in this period of time though, before the Civil War, we don't know a lot about the Lincoln's interest in this subject. Um, we do know that um, their oldest boy, Robert, was bitten by a dog and Mary was convinced the dog was rabbit. Rabbit. So she had her husband take Robert off to Terre Haute, Indiana where there was a famous mad stone. Now, a mad stone is a putrefaction of vegetable matter found in an animal's intestines. And applied to a womb or cut, it was thought to draw out poisons. A lot of people uh, resorted to the Terre Haute mad stone. And Lincoln, Lincoln and Robert went to see it. It was applied to Robert. Lincoln confessed that it looked kind of superstitious to do something like this. But he said if the people of that town went to it constantly and resorted to it day after day, um, that meant something, and he would defer right to their judgments and, and their thoughts. 
uh, on the thing. Lincoln would be happy to know that Robert lived to a very, very ripe old age in his 80s. So whatever, whatever happened there, uh, the dog wasn't mad or the mad stone did its work. Now I put up a little slide of Lincoln uh, on a flatboat sailing down to New Orleans in the um, 1820s or around 1830 when he was a very young man. He went down there to New Orleans twice and while he was down there, there's a persistent story, kind of a Lincoln legend, that he met, quote, an old fortune teller, a voodoo negress, close quote, who told him that he would become president one day and that all the Negroes would be free, close quote. Now Isaac Arnold, who was a Lincoln friend and biographer, here's a picture of Arnold, wrote a very early biography of Lincoln. He thought this story was unbelievable. I mean, to think that essentially a teenage Lincoln would be told this and then Lincoln in his 60s would accomplish it, that, that was not believable. But I noticed he printed it in his book anyway, saying it is tradition. Um, but nevertheless, Arnold was uncomfortable about the story because he never heard it from himself from Lincoln and he heard many things from Lincoln. So he turned to someone who knew Lincoln even better than he did and that was William Herndon, who was Lincoln's longtime law partner. And Herndon said that, you know, I really can't confirm the story, I can't deny it, but I, I, if memory serves me right, I heard this story from Lincoln's first cousin, John Hanks, who had gone with Lincoln on one of the trips down the Mississippi River. So for what it's worth, in a general way, Herndon did say that he couldn't confirm the story, but if Hanks told it, Hanks was a truthful person and that and Lincoln loved uh, this particular cousin of his. Now let's turn to the Booth family for a second. Uh, not too many people will have been to this house, although you can certainly visit it. This is the family home of John Wilkes Booth. It's located in the countryside near Bel Air, Maryland. So if you're taking like 95 north of Baltimore toward Philadelphia, before you get to Wilmington, before you leave Maryland, you'll hit Harford County and Bel Air is the town seat. And this charming cottage, although it looks grander than a cottage, uh, it was called a cottage at the time. This charming cottage is out in the country from Bel Air. It was built in the early 1850s by John Wilkes Booth's father, uh, shown here on the left. This is Junius Brutus Booth Sr., talented, eccentric actor in the generation before the Civil War. And I would say in the generation before the Civil War, in the generation not of Lincoln but of Andrew Jackson, the earlier generation, he was at times beyond question. Uh, the greatest actor in the United States. He's shown here with his one of his young one of his young sons, Edwin Booth. Now, the elder Booth believed in the absolute sanctity of all living things. Uh, he didn't believe the trees should be cut down for firewood. If you wanted firewood, you gathered limbs that had already fallen from trees that were already down. He didn't believe in killing animals. Uh, he didn't believe in killing foxes or birds or spiders. Um, uh, poisonous snakes, no, you could not kill them. Rats, dirty, filthy rats, no, you can't kill them. Uh, one of the Elder Booth's favorite poems was written by Lord Byron. He had had a, a Newfoundland named uh, Botswain, and that dog died of rabies, and Byron wrote a short poem uh, in tribute to the dog, it's actually been chiseled on the dog's gravesite, which you can go see if you're in the UK. Byron believed, as did Booth, that um, the dog um, and all animal life had souls, and those souls were immortal. So in this beautiful poetic tribute, Byron wrote, the poor dog, in life the firmest friend, the first to welcome, the foremost to defend, whose honest heart is still his master's own, who labors, fights, lives, breathes for him alone, unhonored falls, unnoticed all his worth, denied in heaven the soul he had on earth. Now Booth loved this poem and he believed in its philosophy. One night, in fact, um, an incident occurred in Petersburg, Virginia. Booth had been giving a performance there and when he finished, it was time to travel on to the next town. But unfortunately, uh, the weather was dismal, they decided to spend the night at a tavern. They were sitting around a fire, 
uh, having drinks, convivial talk with the other actors, passing the evening. Uh, Booth recited the poem by Byron. And just at that minute, the uh, light uh, illuminating the room went out and a dog appeared that Booth's foot slipped down and hit. Now, no one saw the dog before. No one knew whose dog it was. Nobody saw it come in. Nobody had any idea who the dog belonged to or why. Um, and Booth and the dog bolted out of the room, just as Booth recited the poem I shared with you. And the elder Booth thought that's a very good example of what he called occult sympathy, you know, of, of, of his being able to like summon you know, the ghost of a dog in such occasion. This is John Wilkes Booth's mother, Mary Ann Holmes. She was given to dreams, given to visions. Uh, you'll notice if, if you can see it clearly, uh, she uh, is afflicted with extropia, that is her left eye deviates out uh, from the center. It was thought that um, anyone whose eye was like that saw more than other people. This is a gift, not an affliction. In other words, you saw twice as much as other people because you're looking in two directions at the same time. Now, when John Wilkes Booth was a baby, this would be about 1833, she was nursing him one evening. He must have been about six months old. Uh, there was, she was sitting before the fire and she just was like swept with an anxiety to know what his future was, what would happen to this baby. And she asked God on the spot to, to, to tell her. And she said that the fireplace in front of her just flared up. And she saw the word country written in the flames. And then the flames faded into the name of her, her baby boy, John, and then died back to normal. And she thought this meant that, you know, he would somehow be involved in an episode uh, of great importance to his country and, and maybe die for it. And we do remember, right, he was uh, almost killed in a burning barn. She told that story many times and one of John Moore's sisters turned it into a poem and that's how we know. We have the poem and we know that story. <clears throat> this is the boy in the picture with the father. This is John's brother Edwin Booth. And Edwin was born in 1833 on this incredible night. It was the night of the Leonid meteor showers. They were coming in, according to astronomers, at about 100,000 meteors uh, an hour. Now, we have these still periodically, but this shower of 33 is thought to be the greatest Leonid meteor shower that's ever been recorded. And I can tell you, if it's anything, look, anything like that, it would have my attention. It would certainly have my attention. Lincoln was a young man in Illinois at that time. He saw the thing too. In fact, his landlord ran in and said, the world is coming to an end, just like the Bible says, look outside. And Lincoln went outside and looked. And he was impressed with the meteors, but he saw that behind the meteors, the constellations, the stars were not moving, they were constant. So he thought, this is something closer to us than the stars, right? And I think the world will live on for a while. Oddly enough, Edwin, uh, whose picture I just shared with you, was born with a call on his face. But anyone with um, a call was said, at least by the servants on the booth farm, to be uh, gifted to see ghosts. And also, and as a bonus, you can't drown if, if you're born with a call. Certainly, Edwin was superstitious. Uh, he was afraid of ivy vines. He was afraid of peacock feathers. Uh, it would take a, a long time to list all the things he was afraid of. Uh, he just had his share of family superstitions, as did the rest. John Wilkes Booth, uh, who was a very handsome young actor, as you could see in the 1850s, he was very superstitious too. In fact, one person knew him said that his mind was like a haunted house. There was so much going on there. But there were some uh, Romani, formerly in the old days called gypsies, who passed through the country. And he went down to have his fortune told by them. And the um, lady telling the fortune said that um, she had never seen a worse hand. She said, I wish I, wish I hadn't seen your hand, I really do. Um, you know, you'll live fast, burn bright, die young. 
you'll have a herd of enemies. Many will love you, but at the end, you'll be surrounded by a thundering herd of enemies. And uh, that sure sounded like the way he ended his life. I remember Booth told her, I'm supposed to pay you for a fortune like this? I thought I was supposed to get good news or something. Uh, she said, well, I just, you know, uh, I don't know. I'm telling you what I'm seeing. He said, is there any way I can avoid this? He was 13 when this happened. Any way I can avoid this? And she said, well, maybe become a missionary or something. I really don't see very much you can do there. He told his sister about it, and she said, forget that. that she doesn't know anything. That's stupid. You know, forget it. It's nothing. And he said, you're right. You're right. He laughed it off. But he kept the fortune. He kept that paper he wrote the fortune down on for many years. And she said later when he got to be a young man, he often, when something unlucky happened to him, he reverted to that and, and mentioned that. Here we see the gypsies passing through Maryland. And of course, we have no photograph of the, uh, <laughs> the actual, or drawing or image or likeness of the actual uh, gypsy fortune teller. But I like to put this up. This is Maria Ospenskaya, a great character actor from the 1930s. She was in the um, Bella Le, uh, Lon Chaney Jr.'s Wolfman movie as the fortune teller there. So I just, I kind of like to stick that up there. One of the most eye-catching things that happened in this period of time was the comet of 1860. In July of 60, a rare earth-grazing meteor went right over New York City. It was so close, many people thought, this is fireworks, right? I mean, they couldn't believe what they were looking at. And it broke up into, you know, a very eye-catching uh, train uh, of rocks. And it was all everyone could talk about the next day. In fact, um, they talked about it because celestial fireworks like this usually meant dramatic changes in society. Uh, I mean, there was a similar visitor the night before Caesar was killed. Told a story in War and Peace, you know, talked about the uh, omen of a comet, you know, that presaged the invasion of Russia by, by Napoleon. And sure enough, nine months later, the American Civil War started. So many people thought, okay, that's what the comet was about. Now, Lincoln became president in 61, the year the war began, and was settled in the White House when he lost his second son. This is Willie Lincoln, 11 years old when he died in the White House of typhoid fever. Now, this was, to lose any of the four boys he had would have been a tragedy, but this one, this was the, everyone outside the family said, this is the smart one, this is the good looking one, this is the one that has the intelligence and compassion of his father and, and, and the lively person, personality of his mother. You know, and Mary, of course, was just devastated when Willie died because she had already said, this will be the boy that will take care of me when I'm old. This is the one that will be there when, when I'm an old, old woman. Uh, and of course, the family now has lost two boys in 12 years. They're devastated by this. They bring in a succession of ministers to counsel them. Here's Reverend Francis, Francis Fenton. Um, he talked to the Lincolns about the loss of the child, um, said that Willie was in a better place than earth now because he's in heaven with God. Vinton had lost four children of his own, but he had eight others at home. So life had not shaken his self-regard uh, or his opinions in this matter. Another minister who came in was Reverend John Pierpont. Um, he is the maternal grandfather of J.P. Morgan, the famous uh, New York banker. Uh, he was a former Unitarian minister, but he had converted to spiritualism. And um, his wife, Mary, died in 1855. He believed he was in close daily touch with her. So he took Mary to seances in Washington, as did another interesting character uh, named Isaac Newton. Now this, of course, is not the famous scientist Sir Isaac Newton. This is someone entirely different. He's a Pennsylvania farmer, a kind-hearted, personal, uh, personable, gossipy Quaker a fellow, poorly educated. And as he grew into adulthood, he took no steps to um, remedy the defect of his education. But, you know, if his lack of education was not his fault, it was, I think, his misfortune. Uh, there are all sorts of amusing stories told about him uh, where he would uh, mix up words, or he would say things, for example, like, uh, birds didn't have 
plumage, they had foliage, for example. That made Lincoln laugh so hard, uh, he, he bit over double. On another occasion, uh, Newton, who was Commissioner of Agriculture, was called up to Congress to testify on the spending of the Agricultural Department. And one congressman said, you know, your spending has been exorbitant, just exorbitant. Newton said, well, well, thank you, uh, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the, the, uh, the compliment. I mean, yeah, <laughs> he was kind of the unofficial jester of the Lincoln administration and compared often uh, unfavorably with Sir Isaac Newton. In fact, people who like to tease him called him Sir Isaac Newton, which of course was a, a, an open joke. Now, Newton and Pierpont took Mary Lincoln to, uh, there's Newton trying to explain himself, um, took Mary to Georgetown to a seance at the home of the, um, of the Lorries. We see sitting at a piano Bell Miller. She was called by the newspapers the Witch of Georgetown uh, because the Lincolns would go occasionally, especially Mary, at least once her husband, to a seance in which Bell could allegedly cause a piano to levitate even with the president sitting on it. Now, other people disputed that this incident ever occurred. But the best known association Lincoln has with spiritualism, we get through the writings of this young woman here. Her name is Nellie, Nettie Coburn. She wrote a biography some years after the war and documents about a dozen seances that Lincoln's attended over a two year period. And many of the illustrations we see, if you, if you typed in Lincoln spiritualism, uh, you would get illustrations. Uh, there would be these, uh, these, uh, and they are from her autobiography, as I said. Now, to take a look at this, uh, these images, you'll see this is not in the dark of night. This is not in a room with candles, lit by candles and featuring skulls. These seances were held in the middle of the day on a bright afternoon or in a room in the evening lit with candles and lamps in a fireplace. So, you know, there's not as a lot of the, what we associate with the hocus pocus of spiritualism going on here. There would be uh, usually music played, uh, someone would recite a poem, someone would tell a story, and then at some point Nettie would lapse into uh, her seance. It would go on for about an hour, she would talk in the voice of, a, of another person. It could be an ancient uh, Indian uh, princess. It could be some quaint New England doctor that she knew in childhood. Uh, and, and they would tell the Lincolns things. Um, you'll see things of encouragement, often um, things about uh, how the freed men, the former slaves and slave women needed uh, better treatment than were getting, things the army needed. In other words, uh, talking about concerns that any public spirited citizen in this period of time might be willing to speak of. Now, critics of spiritualism, and believe me, there were plenty of them, came from two directions. One, that spiritualism is silly. I mean, there's nothing to this. You know, these are people that are, are acting or they, they don't realize they're acting, but they're, they're talking in tongues and acting stupid and they're being preyed upon Notice in this illustration, we have a fox who's lining up some geese and rabbits to fleece them, if not worse, that, you know, the, the people go to seances are, are weak-minded, silly people. You know, they're brokenhearted, they're afflicted, they're troubled, they want something. Um, and that, that's the way the criticism went. Another uh, direction of criticism was, what is this? I mean, is this godly? Is this Christian? Is it possible? for a, um, is it possible for a, a Christian to be a spiritualist? Because the dead go to God, right? Uh, hopefully the good ones, you know, to, to a very good place. And uh, it's wrong to try to hold them on earth through seances, you know, holding on to a leg when they're trying to, you know, when they're on their way to some far, far better place. I might say the criticism of the Lincolns uh, was almost always from his political enemies in this regard, the criticism. You know, his friends never mentioned it. And um, those who knew about it thought, well, this is, he's just doing this because of his wife, she's weird, we all know that, blah, blah, blah. 
that, uh, that this wasn't any real uh, critique of the president. Edwin Booth, the, the young man born on the uh, night of the Leonid meteor showers, um, married a beautiful young actress named Molly Devlin. Uh, she was the mother of their small daughter. Uh, but during this period of time, Edwin lost his call. You do not do that. That brought a cascade of bad luck. Uh, and um, the next thing you know, Mary uh, dies. Uh, she died pregnant with their second child. She was essentially almost a child bride. She was still quite young when she died. And so Edwin began to go to uh, seances, accompanied uh, uh, particularly uh, seances with this fellow, Charles Foster. Now he was a very famous medium in this time who also went to the White House and attended the Lincolns. So it is curious, isn't it, that the Lincolns were going to the, to the same mediums as the Booths. There were thousands of spiritualists, but I think the top tier, there weren't that many. You know, and he was one of the best of the best. John Wilkes Booth liked these fellows. These are the Davenport brothers. Uh, they were famous for doing a box illusion in which uh, they would get in a box, get tied up, the box would be locked and sealed, they're inside tied, and music would come out from inside the box. So you'd open the box up, and they're still right there tied up where you left them. Now those who witnessed uh, this uh, believed supernatural forces had caused, had caused the music. P.T. Barnum, the showman, and others said they were bogus. Uh, I know both um, Houdini of a later generation and Arthur Conan Doyle of Sherlock Holmes fame concluded the brothers were private believers in spiritualism, but um, the box illusion was actually entertainment to which believers ascribe supernatural elements. One curious thing about Edwin, um, in 1864, we see Edwin, a little bit to the left there, pulling up the collar of someone who has fallen into that dangerous gap, right, between the train and the platform. This was in Jersey City, New Jersey, when everybody was waiting on a train south. Edwin saw someone get knocked toward the train and fall in. He pulled him out. He had no idea who it was. It was Robert Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's oldest son the young man who was treated with a mad stone years before. So John Wilkes Booth's brother saved the life of Abraham Lincoln's son, which is one of the many kind of strange coincidences that I try to bring out, uh, bring out in the book. This is Charles Colchester, a very celebrated medium in the Civil War years. Uh, he's uh, English from the Lake Country District. He had an amazing personality. He was charming, talented, sociable plausible. One of his gimmicks was to read seal messages. You would, you would write a message of your concern and put it in a bowl with other messages. He would stir the bowl and take one out and hold it. And then he would say, yes, your grandmother May, May Johnson is very concerned about you. And he could say that without opening the paper. And it just blew people's minds when he did that. Now, Mary Lincoln saw him at uh, the Lincoln summer home and brought him into the White House to meet with her husband. And <clears throat> one of Colchester's great feats was he was able to produce noises from the wall. He's sitting here, but noises coming out from there. And Lincoln, when Lincoln saw that, Lincoln said, I don't, damn, <laughs> I, I'm not sure, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm mystified. So we asked, um, Colchester to go over to the Smithsonian Institution. Oh, by the way, here's one of Colchester's ads. A modest statement of his abilities. So Lincoln asked Colchester to go over to the Smithsonian, which in those days was just the castle, right? That was the only part of the Smithsonian there was. Uh, and uh, speak with Joseph Henry, who was secretary. Um, this was going to be a rather challenging for Colchester because Henry was a skeptic of spiritualism. He had often argued with um, Judge Pierpoint about that. Judge Pierpoint said, one time I saw a medium get up and kind of float out the window. And Henry said, you never saw that. And if you did, you know, you're in serious 
mental difficulties, right? You never saw anything like that. So it was known that Henry was unfriendly to spiritualism, but unfortunately for Colchester, he was uh, an acoustic genius. His scientific specialty was acoustics. So he asked Colchester to do what he had done for Lincoln. Colchester did. You know, Henry studied it, walked around, looked, cocked his ear, searched for singularities, and he told Colchester, I don't know how you're doing that. I know you're doing it, but I don't know how. It's you, I know it is, but I, I don't know how you're doing this. So he had to report back to Lincoln that, um, you know, I, don't, I can't tell you, I can't explain what I'm seeing here. Now, um, I'll say that um, one of Colchester's problems was he was a very heavy drinker. And when he drank, he told people things like how he did his stuff. For example, the uh, noises in the wall. He had an apparatus on his biceps that he could flex and it would reduce the clicking noise. It would be imperceptible, you know, for anybody sitting near him. But he could produce noises all over the place. The seal pellets, what he would do there, he told a friend, was he would retrieve one and just drop it in his lap and say, well, let me, let's begin. And then he would pick up the second pellet while down in his lap, opening and reading the first one. So he answered the first one while pretending to read the second one. And then he just kept going. And, and he looked positively uh, amazing in that way. Now, he drank too much. He um, was a flawed character. He was a rascal of the first order. He knew it, but that was the way that he lived well. And when he ran out of money, he told Mary Lincoln he wanted a pass to travel free on all the railroads of the United States. And if she didn't give it to him, he was going to go to the newspapers and tell her all the things she had told him. Now, naturally, seances were, you really, you went, you opened up about your deepest fears, problems, concerns, whatever. You had to lay yourself out with these spiritualists to get answers that you wanted. And so he knew a lot of stuff about her. And she was horrified, right, that he might do that. So she called in a, a family friend. The fellow's name was Noah Brooks. Here's Mary. Called in Noah Brooks, who was a family friend. And Brooks said uh, look, to Colchester, you're a fraud. I know it. You know it. If you're in town 24 hours from now, you're going to be in prison in town. So get out of town and don't bother the Lincolns. Uh, and Colchester wisely took that advice. Colchester was a close friend of John Wilkes Booth. He was often in John Wilkes Booth's room in the weeks before the Lincoln murder. In fact, John Wilkes Booth got him a role starring in a play in Ford's Theater. And um, the government, of course, was very, very interested in him after the murder of Lincoln. They wanted to know, you know, what Colchester knew, where he was, and so forth, but they couldn't find him. He had disappeared from Washington. Well, the war came to an end in 65. I'll skip ahead for a second. Uh, Colchester did not exactly disappear. In fact, he got arrested uh, by the government because he would not pay taxes. Uh, the government had put a little tax on people who entertain for a living, jugglers and so forth. He said, wait a minute, I'm not a juggler. I I'm a spiritualist. I'm not performing tricks here. And he issued uh, a complaint that spiritualism was like a religion. You know, it explained life after death. It, it, it had it had very similar religious elements to any other faith. And therefore, this was religious persecution of him. He, uh, and he's not going to pay the tax. So they had this big trial in Buffalo, New York. It was a rather amusing situation, as a matter of fact. Uh, it attracted nationwide attention. And the jury, of course, uh, found Colchester guilty in about 20 minutes and ordered him to get a pay the tax like everybody else in the United States. Now, Lincoln and Booth are now, of course, fatally entwined. If you can see, uh, I've enlarged and hollowed a little bit a ring that Booth is wearing. You'll see it's in the pattern of a snake. He found that snake, a stone, had a ring made out of it, found the ring mm, on a hike in a mountain in New Hampshire. And he said this was his snake ring and it had a supernatural power over him. Uh, and um, 
I thought that was kind of interesting because um, you know, you're always look, looking to understand the mind, and explore the mind of these people. And uh, that ring has disappeared, but don't believe me, anytime I say a pile of junk, I'm, I'm looking for something that looks like that. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's not out there somewhere. Booth has now decided though to, and some of you may know this, he didn't really want to kill Lincoln. At first he wanted to kidnap him. Then he would take Lincoln down and give him to the Confederacy, and they could use him as a bargaining chip for peace or whatever. But unfortunately, uh, the war came to an end. There was no Confederacy to take Lincoln to, even if they could have kidnapped him. So um, Booth decided on assassination. This is the assassination scene taken from a fan, from a fan uh, made in Cuba uh, right after the, the war. And what we uh, see about this fan, it has scenes. And notice the devils around uh, the frame uh, encouraging Booth on to uh, his evil deed. Otherwise, the scene is pretty, pretty far-fetched uh, as far as what the shooting actually looked like. But nevertheless, he got behind Lincoln. It was no trouble, of course, getting into the theater where he was a famous actor. He wasn't in the play that night, but he was well known in the theater as a star, could come and go as he wished. There's the uh, actual weapon that Booth used. It's a one-shot weapon called a Derringer. It's a little less than six inches long, so it could be held in a hand. It weighs about what a large apple would weigh. Uh, and it's a very small thing, but it's a one-shot weapon. So once you used it, you didn't have time to reload it, right? You shot, you dropped it, you took off. And that's what Lincoln, that's what Booth did after shooting Lincoln in the back of the head. He was on the run for about 12 days uh, when he was finally quartered and shot through the neck by northern soldiers when he would not surrender himself. Uh, he lingered for several hours, great suffering. In fact, one of the doctors there said, I, people who died on the rack didn't die any harder than Booth did because uh, he lost uh, essentially the uh, ability to breathe and just basically suffocated to death. He was properly identified in autopsy. There are all these stories about it wasn't Booth that they killed. It was Booth. A body had his tattoo on it, um, his bank book on it, his diary on it. Two of the officers in the scene knew Booth personally. Uh, the person with him said it was Booth. Everyone knew. I mean, if it was me or some other person from out there, maybe they wouldn't know. But he was a famous actor. A lot of people knew who he was. There's no doubt about the identification of the body. Uh, so he was properly identified by federal authorities. Um, they, government kept him for about four years, and then they turned him over to the family, and he was taken to Greenmount Cemetery in Baltimore City. Uh, these are the gates still there. You go right through, and off to the right, you'll see the Booth gravesite. I'm actually standing there, um, at the spot where he's buried. The monument is to his father. The other stones around are for his, two of his sisters and one brother and some family members. He does not have a stone. Uh, his older brother Edwin thought that it might become a point of contention, you know, crazy people would celebrate Lincoln's death there, Lincoln haters would dig him up. So it's just best not to put a stone there and they never did. But there's no doubt about where he's buried, and he's buried right there. Now, it is kind of interesting. If you look around, there are all sorts of Lincoln pennies on the headstones and footstones there. Since they have, uh, he has no gravestone, they just put them on the stones of family members. This is the footstone for his sister Asia. So, I mean, she's, will have to bear the burden for her brother, I guess. Uh, these are all Lincoln pennies, and seem to say that Lincoln got the last word in the argument over, over who, who, who won. This is Keokuk, Iowa, where Charles Colchester died. He was touring out west when he got sick and died and was taken to uh, uh, the cemetery, Oakland Cemetery in Keokuk, uh, and buried there. He, he doesn't have a gravestone or marker either, and the reason is well, perhaps as an indigent stranger, he didn't have the money for a stone, 
and nobody cared enough about him to do more than bury him. But it's also quite possible, according to local legend, that the students from the uh, local medical college dug him up. You know, they have lab work to do. And here's, here's a fresh prospect. So uh, not having any family around to object, perhaps students from the, the cemetery help themselves, you know, t to Colchester for, uh, for lab work. Uh, that's just a local story that circulates in Keokirk, but it, it's quite possible. Some of you may know that in 1893, which would be, what, 27 or eight years after Lincoln's murder, Ford's Theater collapsed. Um, there had been no plays there since the murder. The government bought the building and turned it into an office space. So all the theater seats were taken out and floors put in for clerks who were put in there with desks, dozens and dozens of clerks, heavy files of pension records, medical records, all crammed into the thing. And a lot of people thought, this doesn't look you know, really super safe. Um, uh, they would hear kind of creaking noises, you know, making them wonder if the building was secure. And sure enough, in June of 1893, uh, the floors began to give way. They began to fall down on each other, killing um, 20 people outright, injuring hundreds of other people. And this happened to be at the very day and the very moment that John Wilkes Booth Edwin's funeral was taking place in New York City. Edwin's funeral parade was going right down Broadway at the minute that Ford's Theater collapsed. This again, 1893. Lastly, this thought from a New York journalist, Maurice Menton, thinking about the Ford's Theater collapse at the time that Edwin was being buried. Menton wrote, there is something gruesome and uncanny about Ford's Theater, no matter how you look at it. We may say that no other such tragic interest hangs about any other building that can be thought of in this country. What mysterious combination of threads and events has brought about the melancholy association of the Lincolns and the Booths? Thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate that.